Track 21. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by David Barnes. Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Track 21. The manner in which Mr. Fairley's narrative, and other narratives that are shortly to follow it, were originally obtained, forms the subject of an explanation which will appear at a later period. The story continued by Frederick Fairley, Esquire, of Limeridge House. It is the grand misfortune of my life that nobody will let me alone. Why? I ask everybody, why worry me? Nobody answers that question, and nobody lets me alone. Relatives, friends, and strangers all combine to annoy me. What have I done, I ask myself? I ask my servant, Louis, fifty times a day, what have I done? Neither of us can tell. Most extraordinary. The last annoyance that has assailed me is the annoyance of being called upon to write this narrative. Is a man in my state of nervous wretchedness capable of writing narratives? When I put this extremely reasonable objection, I am told that certain very serious events relating to my niece have happened within my experience, and that I am the fit person to describe them on that account. I am threatened, if I fail to exert myself in the manner required, with consequences which I cannot so much as think of without perfect prostration. There is really no need to threaten me. Shattered by my miserable health and my family troubles, I am incapable of resistance. If you insist, you take your unjust advantage of me, and I give way immediately. I will endeavour to remember what I can, under protest, and to write what I can, also under protest, and what I can't remember and can't write, Louis must remember and write for me. He is an ass, and I am an invalid, and we are likely to make all sorts of mistakes between us. How humiliating! I am told to remember dates. Good heavens, I never did such a thing in my life. How am I to begin now? I have asked Louis. He is not quite such an ass as I have hitherto supposed. He remembers the date of the event within a week or two, and I remember the name of the person. The date was towards the end of June, or the beginning of July, and the name, in my opinion a remarkably vulgar one, was Fanny. At the end of June, or the beginning of July, then, I was reclining in my customary state, surrounded by the various objects of art which I have collected about me to improve the taste of the barbarous people in my neighbourhood, that is to say, I had the photographs of my pictures, and prints, and coins, and so forth, all about me, which I intend one of these days to present, uh, the photographs, I mean, if the clumsy English language will let me mean anything, to present to the institution at Carlisle, horrid place, with a view to improving the tastes of the members, goths and vandals to a man. It might be supposed that a gentleman who was in course of conferring a great national benefit on his countrymen was the last gentleman in the world 
to be unfeelingly worried about private difficulties and family affairs. Quite a mistake, I assure you, in my case. However, there I was, reclining, with my art treasures about me, and wanting a quiet morning. Because I wanted a quiet morning, of course, Louis came in. It was perfectly natural that I should inquire what the deuce he meant by making his appearance when I had not rung the bell. I seldom swear. It is such an ungentlemanlike habit. But when Louis answered with a grin, I think it was also perfectly natural that I should damn him for grinning. At any rate, I did. This rigorous mode of treatment, I have observed, invariably brings persons in the lower class of life to their senses. It brought Louis to his senses. He was so obliging as to leave off grinning, and inform me that a young person was outside waiting to see me. He added, with the odious talkativeness of servants, that her name was Fanny. Who is Fanny? Lady Glyde's maid, sir. What does Lady Glyde's maid want with me? A letter, sir. Take it. She refuses to give it to anybody but you, sir. Who sends the letter? Miss Halcombe, sir. The moment I heard Miss Halcombe's name I gave up. It is a habit of mine always to give up to Miss Halcombe. I find, by experience, that it saves noise. I gave up on this occasion. Dear Marian, let Lady Glyde's maid come in, Louis. Stop! Do her shoes creak? I was obliged to ask the question. Creaking shoes invariably upset me for the day. I was resigned to see the young person, but I was not resigned to let the young person's shoes upset me. There is a limit even to my endurance. Louis affirmed distinctly that her shoes were to be depended upon. I waved my hand. He introduced her. Is it necessary to say that she expressed her sense of embarrassment by shutting up her mouth and breathing through her nose? To the student of female human nature in the lower orders, surely not. Let me do the girl justice. Her shoes did not creak. But why do young persons in service all perspire at their hands? Why have they all got fat noses and hard cheeks? And why are their faces so sadly unfinished, especially about the corners of the eyelids? I'm not strong enough to think deeply myself on the subject, but I appeal to professional men who are. Why have we no variety in our breed of young persons? You have a letter for me from Miss Halcombe. Put it down on the table, please, and don't upset anything. How is Miss Halcombe? Very well, thank you, sir. And Lady Glyde? I received no answer. The young person's face became more unfinished than ever, and I think she began to cry. I certainly saw something moist about the eyes. Tears or perspiration? 
Louis, whom I have just consulted, is inclined to think tears. He is in her class of life, and he ought to know best. Let us say tears. Except when the refining process of art judiciously removes from them all semblance to nature, I distinctly object to tears. Tears are scientifically described as a secretion. I can understand that a secretion may be healthy or unhealthy, but I cannot see the interest of a secretion from a sentimental point of view. Perhaps my own secretions being all wrong together, I am a little prejudiced on the subject. No matter, I behaved on this occasion with all possible propriety and feeling. I closed my eyes and said to Louis, Endeavour to ascertain what she means. Louis endeavoured, and the young person endeavoured. They succeeded in confusing each other to such an extent that I am bound in common gratitude to say they really amused me. I think I shall send for them again when I am in low spirits. I have just mentioned this idea to Louis. Strange to say, it seems to make him uncomfortable. Poor devil! Surely I am not expected to repeat my niece's maid's explanation of her tears, interpreted in the English of my Swiss valet. The thing is manifestly impossible. I can give my own impressions and feelings, perhaps. Will that do as well? Please say yes. My idea is that she began by telling me, through Louis, that her master had dismissed her from her mistress's service. Observe throughout the strange irrelevancy of the young person. Was it my fault that she had lost her place? On her dismissal she had gone to the inn to sleep. I don't keep the inn. Why mention it to me? Between six o'clock and seven, Miss Halcombe had come to say good-bye, and had given her two letters, one for me and one for a gentleman in London. I am not a gentleman in London. Hang the gentleman in London! She had carefully put the two letters into her bosom. What have I to do with her bosom? She had been very unhappy when Miss Halcombe had gone away again. She had not had the heart to put bit or drop between her lips till it was near bedtime, and then, when it was close on nine o'clock, she had thought she would like a cup of tea. Am I responsible for any of these vulgar fluctuations which begin with unhappiness and end with tea? Ah, oh, just as she was warming the pot. I give the words on the authority of Louis, who says he knows what they mean, and wishes to explain, but I snub him on principle. Just as she was warming the pot, the door opened, and she was struck of a heap her own words again, and perfectly unintelligible this time to Louis as well as to myself, by the appearance in the inn parlour of her ladyship the Countess. I give my niece's maid's description of my sister's title with a sense of the highest relish. My poor dear sister is a tiresome woman who married a foreigner. To resume, 
the door opened her ladyship the countess appeared in the parlour and the young person was struck of a heap most remarkable i must really rest a little before i can go on any farther when i have reclined for a few minutes with my eyes closed and when louis has refreshed my poor aching temples with a little eau de cologne i may be able to proceed her ladyship the countess no i am able to proceed but not to sit up i will recline and dictate louis has a horrid accent but he knows the language and can write how very convenient her ladyship the countess explained her unexpected appearance at the inn by telling fanny that she had come to bring one or two little messages which miss halcombe in her hurry had forgotten the young person thereupon waited anxiously to hear what the messages were but the countess seemed disinclined to mention them so like my sister's tiresome way until fanny had had her tea her ladyship was surprisingly kind and thoughtful about it extremely unlike my sister and said i am sure my poor girl you must want your tea we can let the messages wait till afterwards come come if nothing else will put you at your ease i'll make the tea and have a cup with you i think those were the words as reported excitably in my presence by the young person at any rate the countess insisted on making the tea and carried her ridiculous ostentation of humility so far as to take one cup herself and to insist on the girl's taking the other the girl drank the tea and according to her own account solemnized the extraordinary occasion five minutes afterwards by fainting dead away for the first time in her life here again i use her own words louis thinks they were accompanied by an increased secretion of tears i cannot say myself the effort of listening being quite as much as i could manage my eyes were closed where did i leave off ah yes she fainted after drinking a cup of tea with the countess a proceeding which might have interested me if i had been her medical man but being nothing of the sort i felt bored by hearing of it nothing more when she came to herself in half an hour's time she was on the sofa and nobody was with her but the landlady the countess finding it too late to remain any longer at the inn had gone away as soon as the girl showed signs of recovering and the landlady had been good enough to help her upstairs to bed left by herself she had felt in her bosom i regret the necessity of referring to this part of the subject a second time and had found the two letters there quite safe but strangely crumpled she had been giddy in the night but had got up well enough to travel in the morning she had put the letter addressed to that obtrusive stranger the gentleman in london into the post and had now delivered the other letter into my hands as she was told this was the plain truth and though she could not blame herself for any intentional neglect she was sadly troubled in her mind and sadly in want of a word of advice at this point louis thinks the secretions appeared again 
Perhaps they did, but it is of infinitely greater importance to mention that at this point also I lost my patience, opened my eyes, and interfered. What is the purport of all this? I inquired. My niece's irrelevant maid stared and stood speechless. Endeavour to explain, I said to my servant. Translate me, Louis. Louis endeavoured and translated. In other words, he descended immediately into a bottomless pit of confusion, and the young person followed him down. I really don't know when I have been so amused. I left them at the bottom of the pit as long as they diverted me. When they ceased to divert me, I exerted my intelligence and pulled them up again. It is unnecessary to say that my interference enabled me, in due course of time, to ascertain the purport of the young person's remarks. I discovered that she was uneasy in her mind because the train of events that she had just described to me had prevented her from receiving those supplementary messages which Miss Halcombe had entrusted to the Countess to deliver. She was afraid the messages might have been of great importance to her mistress's interests. Her dread of Sir Percival had deterred her from going to Blackwater Park late at night to inquire about them, and Miss Halcombe's own directions to her, on no account to miss the train in the morning, had prevented her from waiting at the inn the next day. She was most anxious that the misfortune of her fainting fit should not lead to the second misfortune of making her mistress think her neglectful, and she would humbly beg to ask me whether I would advise her to write her explanations and excuses to Miss Halcombe, requesting to receive the messages by letter if it was not too late. I make no apologies for this extremely prosy paragraph. I have been ordered to write it. There are people, unaccountable as it may appear, who actually take more interest in what my niece's maid said to me on this occasion than in what I said to my niece's maid. Amusing perversity. I should feel very much obliged to you, sir, if you would kindly tell me what I had better do, remarked the young person. Let things stop as they are, I said, adapting my language to my listener. I invariably let things stop as they are. Yes, is that all? If you think it would be a liberty in me, sir, to write, of course I wouldn't venture to do so, but I am so very anxious to do all I can to serve my mistress faithfully. People in the lower class of life never know when or how to go out of a room. They invariably require to be helped out by their betters. I thought it high time to help the young person out. I did it with two judicious words, Good morning. Something outside or inside this singular girl suddenly creaked. Louis, who was looking at her, which I was not, says she creaked when she curtsied. Curious. Was it her shoes, her stays, or her bones? Louis thinks it was her stays. Most extraordinary. As soon as I was left by myself, I had a little nap. I really wanted it. 
When I awoke again I noticed dear Marion's letter. If I had had the least idea of what it contained, I should certainly not have attempted to open it, being, unfortunately for myself, quite innocent of all suspicion, I read the letter. It immediately upset me for the day. I am by nature one of the most easy-tempered creatures that ever lived. I make allowances for everybody, and I take offence at nothing. But as I have before remarked, there are limits to my endurance. I laid down Marion's letter, and felt myself, justly felt myself, an injured man. I am about to make a remark. It is, of course, applicable to the very serious matter now under notice, or I should not allow it to appear in this place. Nothing, in my opinion, sets the odious selfishness of mankind in such a repulsively vivid light as the treatment in all classes of society which the single people receive at the hands of the married people. When you have once shown yourself too considerate and self-denying to add a family of your own, to an already overcrowded population, you are vindictively marked out by your married friends, who have no similar consideration and no similar self-denial, as the recipient of half their conjugal troubles, and the born friend of all their children. Husbands and wives, talk of the cares of matrimony, and bachelors and spinsters bear them. Take my own case. I considerately remain single, and my poor dear brother Philip inconsiderately marries. What does he do when he dies? He leaves his daughter to me. She is a sweet girl. She is also a dreadful responsibility. Why lay her on my shoulders? Because I am bound, in the harmless character of a single man, to relieve my married connections of all their own troubles. I do my best with my brother's responsibility. I marry my niece with little fuss and difficulty to the man her father wanted her to marry. She and her husband disagree, and unpleasant consequences follow. What does she do with those consequences? She transfers them to me. Why transfer them to me? Because I am bound, in the harmless character of a single man, to relieve my married connections of all their own troubles. Poor single people, poor human nature. It is quite unnecessary to say that Marion's letter threatened me. Everybody threatens me. All sorts of horrors were to fall on my devoted head if I hesitated to turn Limeridge House into an asylum for my niece and her misfortunes. I did hesitate, nevertheless. I have mentioned that my usual course hitherto had been to submit to dear Marian and save noise, but on this occasion the consequences involved in her extremely inconsiderate proposal were of a nature to make me pause. 
if I opened Limeridge House as an asylum to Lady Glyde, what security had I against Sir Percival Glyde's following her here in a state of violent resentment against me for harbouring his wife? I saw such a perfect labyrinth of troubles involved in this proceeding that I determined to feel my ground, as it were. I wrote, therefore, to dear Marian, to beg, as she had no husband to lay claim to her, that she would come here by herself first and talk the matter over with me. If she could answer my objections to my own perfect satisfaction, then I assured her that I would receive our sweet Laura with the greatest pleasure, but not otherwise. I felt, of course, at the time that this temporizing on my part would probably end in bringing Marian here in a state of virtuous indignation, banging doors, but then the other course of proceeding might end in bringing Sir Percival here in a state of virtuous indignation, banging doors also and of the two indignations and bangings I preferred Marian's, because I was used to her. Accordingly I dispatched the letter by return of post. It gained me time at all events, and, oh dear me, what a point that was to begin with! When I am totally prostrated, did I mention that I was totally prostrated by Marian's letter? It always takes me three days to get up again. I was very unreasonable. I expected three days of quiet. Of course, I didn't get them. The third day's post brought me a most impertinent letter, from a person with whom I was totally unacquainted. He described himself as the acting partner of our man of business, our dear pig-headed old Gilmore, and he informed me that he had lately received, by the post, a letter addressed to him in Miss Halcombe's handwriting. On opening the envelope he had discovered, to his astonishment, that it contained nothing but a blank sheet of note-paper. This circumstance appeared to him so suspicious, as suggesting to his restless legal mind that the letter had been tampered with, that he had at once written to Miss Halcombe, and had received no answer by return of post. In this difficulty, Instead of acting like a sensible man and letting things take their proper course, his next absurd proceeding, on his own showing, was to pester me by writing to inquire if I knew anything about it. What the deuce should I know about it? Why alarm me as well as himself? I wrote back to that effect. It was one of my keenest letters. I have produced nothing with a sharper epistolary edge to it since I tendered his dismissal in writing to that extremely troublesome person, Mr. Walter Hartwright. My letter produced its effect. I heard nothing more from the lawyer. This perhaps was not altogether surprising, but it was certainly a remarkable circumstance that no second letter reached me from Marian, and that no warning signs appeared of her arrival. Her unexpected absence did me amazing good. It was so very soothing and pleasant to infer, as I did, of course, that my married connections had made it up again. 
five days of undisturbed tranquillity, of delicious single blessedness, quite restored me. On the sixth day, I felt strong enough to send for my photographer and to set him at work again on the presentation copies of my art treasures with a view, as I have already mentioned, to the improvement of taste in this barbarous neighbourhood. I had just dismissed him to his workshop and had just begun coquetting with my coins when Louis suddenly made his appearance with a card in his hand. "'Another young person,' I said. "'I won't see her. "'In my state of health, young persons disagree with me. "'Not at home.' "'It is a gentleman this time, sir.' "'A gentleman, of course, made a difference. "'I looked at the card.' "'Gracious heaven! My tiresome sister's foreign husband, Count Fosco. "'Is it necessary to say what my first impression was "'when I looked at my visitor's card? Surely not. "'My sister having married a foreigner, "'there was but one impression that any man in his senses could possibly feel.' Of course the Count had come to borrow money of me. Louis, I said, do you think he would go away if you gave him five shillings? Louis looked quite shocked. He surprised me inexpressibly by declaring that my sister's foreign husband was dressed superbly and looked the picture of prosperity. Under these circumstances my first impression altered to a certain extent. I now took it for granted that the Count had matrimonial difficulties of his own to contend with, and that he had come, like the rest of the family, to cast them all on my shoulders. Did he mention his business? I asked. Count Fosco said he had come here, sir, because Miss Halcombe was unable to leave Blackwater Park. Fresh troubles, apparently. Not exactly his own, as I had supposed, but dear Marion's. Troubles, anyway. Oh, dear. Show him in, I said resignedly. The Count's first appearance really startled me. He was such an alarmingly large person that I quite trembled. I felt certain that he would shake the floor and knock down my art treasures. He did neither the one nor the other. He was refreshingly dressed in summer costume, his manner was delightfully self-possessed and quiet. He had a charming smile. My first impression of him was highly favourable. It is not creditable to my penetration, as the sequel will show, to acknowledge this, but I am a naturally candid man, and I do acknowledge it notwithstanding. "'Allow me to present myself, Mr. Fairley,' he said. "'I come from Blackwater Park, and I have the honour and the happiness of being Madame Fosco's husband. "'Let me take my first and last advantage of that circumstance "'by entreating you not to make a stranger of me. "'I beg you will not disturb yourself. "'I beg you will not move.' "'You are very good,' I replied. "'I wish I was strong enough to get up. "'Charmed to see you at Limeridge. "'Please take a chair.' "'I am afraid you are suffering today,' said the Count. "'As usual,' I said, "'I am nothing but a bundle of nerves "'dressed up to look like a man.' 
I have studied many subjects in my time, remarked this sympathetic person, among others the inexhaustible subject of nerves. May I make a suggestion, at once the simplest and the most profound? Will you let me alter the light in your room? Certainly, if you will be so very kind as not to let any of it in on me. He walked to the window. Such a contrast to dear Marian, so extremely considerate in all his movements. Light, he said, in that delightfully confidential tone which is so soothing to an invalid, is the first essential. Light stimulates, nourishes, preserves. You can no more do without it, Mr. Fairley, than if you were a flower. Observe. Here, where you sit, I close the shutters to compose you. There, where you do not sit, I draw up the blind and let in the invigorating sun. Admit the light into your room if you cannot bear it on yourself. Light, sir, is the grand decree of providence. You accept providence with your own restrictions. Accept light on the same terms. I thought this very convincing and attentive. He had taken me in up to that point about the light. He had certainly taken me in. "'You see me confused,' he said, returning to his place. "'On my word of honour, Mr. Fairley, you see me confused in your presence.' "'Shocked to hear it, I am sure. May I inquire why?' "'Sir, can I enter this room, where you sit a sufferer, and see you surrounded by these admirable objects of art?' without discovering that you are a man whose feelings are acutely impressionable, whose sympathies are perpetually alive. Tell me, can I do this? If I had been strong enough to sit up in my chair, I should, of course, have bowed. Not being strong enough, I smiled my acknowledgments instead. It did just as well. We both understood one another. "'Pray follow my train of thought,' continued the Count. "'I sit here, a man of refined sympathies myself, "'in the presence of another man of refined sympathies also. "'I am conscious of a terrible necessity for lacerating those sympathies, by referring to domestic events of a very melancholy kind. What is the inevitable consequence? I have done myself the honour of pointing it out to you already. I sit confused. Was it at this point that I began to suspect he was going to bore me? I rather think it was. Is it absolutely necessary to refer to these unpleasant matters i inquired in our homely english phrase count fosco won't they keep the count with the most alarming solemnity sighed and shook his head must i really hear them he shrugged his shoulders. It was the first foreign thing he had done since he had been in the room, and looked at me in an unpleasantly penetrating manner. My instincts told me that I had better close my eyes. I obeyed my instincts. "'Please break it gently,' I pleaded. "'Anybody dead?' "'Dead!' cried the Count, with unnecessary foreign fierceness. "'Mr. Fairley, 
Your national composure terrifies me. In the name of heaven, what have I said or done to make you think me the messenger of death? Pray, accept my apologies, I answered. You have said and done nothing. I make it a rule in these distressing cases always to anticipate the worst. It breaks the blow by meeting it halfway, and so on. Inexpressibly relieved, I am sure, to hear that nobody is dead. Anybody ill? I opened my eyes and looked at him. He was very yellow when he came in, or had he turned very yellow in the last minute or two? I really can't say and I can't ask Louis because he was not in the room at the time. "'Anybody ill?' I repeated, observing that my national composure still appeared to affect him. "'That is part of my bad news, Mr. Fairley. Yes, somebody is ill.' "'Grieved, I am sure. Which of them is it?' to my profound sorrow, Miss Halcombe. Perhaps you were in some degree prepared to hear this, perhaps when you found that Miss Halcombe did not come here by herself as you proposed, and did not write a second time, your affectionate anxiety may have made you fear that she was ill. I have no doubt my affectionate anxiety had led me to that melancholy apprehension at some time or other, but at the present my wretched memory entirely failed to remind me of the circumstance. However, I said yes, in justice to myself, I was much shocked. It was so very uncharacteristic of such a robust person as dear Marian to be ill, that I could only suppose she had met with an accident. A horse, or a false step on the stairs, or something of that sort. "'Is it serious?' I asked. "'Serious, beyond a doubt,' he replied. "'Dangerous?' I hope and trust not. Miss Halcombe unhappily exposed herself to be wetted through by a heavy rain. The cold that followed was of an aggravated kind, and it has now brought with it the worst consequence, fever. When I heard the word fever, and when I remembered at the same moment that the unscrupulous person who was now addressing me had just come from Blackwater Park, I thought I should have fainted on the spot. "'Good God!' I said. "'Is it infectious?' "'Not at present,' he answered, with detestable composure. "'It may turn to infection.' but no such deplorable complication had taken place when I left Blackwater Park. I have felt the deepest interest in the case, Mr. Fairley. I have endeavoured to assist the regular medical attendant in watching it. Accept my personal assurances of the uninfectious nature of the fever when I last saw it. Accept his assurances. I never was farther from accepting anything in my life. I would not have believed him on his oath. He was too yellow to be believed. He looked like a walking West Indian epidemic. He was big enough to carry typhus by the ton, and to dye the very carpet he walked on with scarlet fever. In certain emergencies my mind is remarkably soon made up. I instantly determined to get rid of him. "'You will kindly excuse an invalid,' I said, "'but long conferences of any kind invariably upset me. "'May I beg to know exactly what the object is "'to which I am indebted for the honour of your visit?' 
I fervently hoped that this remarkably broad hint would throw him off his balance, confuse him, reduce him to polite apologies, in short, get him out of the room. On the contrary, it only settled him in his chair. He became additionally solemn and dignified and confidential. He held up two of his horrid fingers and gave me another of his unpleasantly penetrating looks. What was I to do? I was not strong enough to quarrel with him. Conceive my situation, if you please. Is language adequate to describe it? I think not. The objects of my visit, he went on, quite irrepressibly, are numbered on my fingers. They are two. First, I come to bear my testimony with profound sorrow to the lamentable disagreements between Sir Percival and Lady Glyde. I am Sir Percival's oldest friend. I am related to Lady Glyde by marriage. I am an eye-witness of all that has happened at Blackwater Park. In those three capacities I speak with authority, with confidence, with honourable regret. Sir, I inform you, as the head of Lady Glyde's family, that Miss Halcombe has exaggerated nothing in the letter which she wrote to your address. I affirm that the remedy which that admirable lady has proposed is the only remedy that will spare you the horrors of public scandal. A temporary separation between husband and wife is the one peaceable solution of this difficulty. Part them for the present, and when all causes of irritation are removed, I, who have now the honour of addressing you, I will undertake to bring Sir Percival to reason. Lady Glyde is innocent, Lady Glyde is injured, but follow my thought here, she is on that very account, I say it with shame, the cause of irritation while she remains under her husband's roof. No other house can receive her with propriety but yours. I invite you to open it. Cool. Here, was a matrimonial hailstorm pouring in the south of England, and I was invited by a man with fever in every fold of his coat to come out from the north of England and take my share of the pelting. I tried to put the point forcibly, just as I have put it here. The Count deliberately lowered one of his horrid fingers, kept the other up, and went on, rode over me, as it were, without even the common coachman-like attention of crying high before he knocked me down. Follow my thought once more, if you please, he resumed. My first object you have heard— my second object in coming to this house is to do what Miss Halcombe's illness has prevented her from doing herself. My large experience is consulted on all difficult matters at Blackwater Park, and my friendly advice was requested on the interesting subject of your letter to Miss Halcombe. I understood at once, for my sympathies are your sympathies, why you wished to see her here before you pledged yourself to inviting Lady Glyde. You are most right, sir, in hesitating to receive the wife until you are quite certain that the husband will not exert his authority to reclaim her. I agree to that. 
I also agree that such delicate explanations as this difficulty involves are not explanations which can be properly disposed of by writing only. My presence here, to my own great inconvenience, is the proof that I speak sincerely. As for the explanations themselves, I, Fosco, I, who know Sir Percival much better than Miss Halcombe knows him, affirm to you, on my honour and my word, that he will not come near this house, or attempt to communicate with this house, while his wife is living in it. His affairs are embarrassed. Offer him his freedom by means of the absence of Lady Glyde. I promise you he will take his freedom, and go back to the continent at the earliest moment when he can get away. Is this clear to you as crystal? Yes, it is. Have you questions to address to me? Be it so, I am here to answer. Ask, Mr. Fairley, oblige me by asking to your heart's content. He had said so much already in spite of me, and he looked so dreadfully capable of saying a great deal more also in spite of me, that I declined his amiable invitation in pure self-defence. Many thanks, I replied, I am sinking fast. In my state of health I must take things for granted. Allow me to do so on this occasion. We quite understand each other, yes, much obliged, I am sure, for your kind interference. If I ever get better— and ever have a second opportunity of improving our acquaintance. He got up. I thought he was going. No, more talk, more time for the development of infectious influences. In my room, too. Remember that, in my room. One moment yet, he said. One moment before I take my leave. I ask permission at parting to impress on you an urgent necessity. It is this, sir. You must not think of waiting till Miss Halcombe recovers before you receive Lady Glyde. Miss Halcombe has the attendance of the doctor, of the housekeeper at Blackwater Park, and of an experienced nurse as well. Three persons for whose capacity and devotion I answer with my life. I tell you that. I tell you also that the anxiety and alarm of her sister's illness has already affected the health and spirits of Lady Glyde, and has made her totally unfit to be of use in the sick room. Her position with her husband grows more and more deplorable and dangerous every day. If you leave her any longer at Blackwater Park, you do nothing whatever to hasten her sister's recovery, and at the same time you risk the public scandal which you and I, and all of us, are bound in the sacred interests of the family to avoid." With all my soul I advise you to remove the serious responsibility of delay from your own shoulders by writing to Lady Glyde to come here at once. Do your affectionate, your honourable, your inevitable duty, and whatever happens in the future no one can lay the blame on you. I speak from my large experience. I offer my friendly advice. Is it accepted? Yes or no? I looked at him, merely looked at him, with my sense of his amazing assurance and my dawning resolution to ring for Louis and have him shown out of the room expressed in every line of my face. 
it is perfectly incredible but quite true that my face did not appear to produce the slightest impression on him born without nerves evidently born without nerves you hesitate he said mr fairley i understand that hesitation you object see sir how my sympathies look straight down into your thoughts you object that lady glyde is not in health and not in spirits to take the long journey from hampshire to this place by herself her own maid is removed from her as you know and of other servants fit to travel with her from one end of england to the other there are none at blackwater park you object again that she cannot comfortably stop and rest in london on her way here because she cannot comfortably go alone to a public hotel where she is a total stranger in one breath i grant both objections in another breath i remove them follow me if you please for the last time it was my intention when i returned to england with sir percival to settle myself in the neighbourhood of london that purpose has just been happily accomplished i have taken for six months a little furnished house in the quarter called st john's wood be so obliging as to keep this fact in your mind and observe the programme i now propose lady glyde travels to london a short journey i myself meet her at the station i take her to rest and sleep at my house which is also the house of her aunt when she is restored i escort her to the station again and she travels to this place and her own maid who is now under your roof receives her at the carriage door here is comfort consulted here are the interests of propriety consulted here is your own duty duty of hospitality sympathy protection to an unhappy lady in need of all three smoothed and made easy from the beginning to the end i cordially invite you sir to second my efforts in the sacred interests of the family i seriously advise you to write by my hands offering the hospitality of your house and heart and the hospitality of my house and heart to that injured and unfortunate lady whose cause i plead to-day he waved his horrid hand at me he struck his infectious breast he addressed me oratorically as if i was laid up in the house of commons it was high time to take a desperate course of some sort it was also high time to send for louis and adopt the precaution of fumigating the room in this trying emergency an idea occurred to me an inestimable idea so to speak killed two intrusive birds with one stone i determined to get rid of the count's tiresome eloquence and of lady glyde's tiresome troubles by complying with this odious foreigner's request and writing the letter at once there was not the least danger of the invitation being accepted for there was not the least chance that laura would consent to leave blackwater park while marian was lying there ill how this charmingly convenient obstacle could have escaped the officious penetration of the count it was impossible to conceive but it had escaped him 
my dread that he might yet discover it if I allowed him any more time to think, stimulated me to such an amazing degree that I struggled into a sitting position, seized, really seized, the writing materials by my side, and produced the letter as rapidly as if I had been a common clerk in an office. Dearest Laura, please come whenever you like. Break the journey by sleeping in London at your aunt's house. Grieved to hear of dear Marian's illness. Ever affectionately yours. I handed these lines at arm's length to the Count. I sank back in my chair. I said, Excuse me, I am entirely prostrated. I can do no more. Will you rest and lunch downstairs? Love to all, and sympathy, and so on. Good morning. He made another speech. The man was absolutely inexhaustible. I closed my eyes. I endeavoured to hear as little as possible. In spite of my endeavours I was obliged to hear a great deal. My sister's endless husband congratulated himself and congratulated me on the result of our interview. He mentioned a great deal more about his sympathies and mine. He deplored my miserable health. He offered to write me a prescription. He impressed on me the necessity of not forgetting what he had said about the importance of light. He accepted my obliging invitation to rest and lunch. He recommended me to expect Lady Glyde in two or three days' time. He begged my permission to look forward to our next meeting, instead of paining himself and paining me by saying farewell, he added a great deal more, which I rejoice to think I did not attend to at the time, and do not remember now. I heard his sympathetic voice travelling away from me by degrees, but, large as he was, I never heard him. He had the negative merit of being absolutely noiseless. I don't know when he opened the door, or when he shut it. I ventured to make use of my eyes again, after an interval of silence, and he was gone. I rang for Louis, and retired to my bathroom. Tepid water, strengthened with aromatic vinegar, for myself, and copious fumigation for my study, were the obvious precautions to take, and of course I adopted them. I rejoice to say they proved successful. I enjoyed my customary siesta. I awoke moist and cool. My first enquiries were for the Count. Had we really got rid of him? Yes, he had gone away by the afternoon train. Had he lunched, and if so, upon what? Entirely upon fruit tart and cream. What a man! What a digestion! Am I expected to say anything more? I believe not. I believe I have reached the limits assigned to me. The shocking circumstances which happened at a later period did not, I am thankful to say, happen in my presence. I do beg and entreat that nobody will be so very unfeeling as to lay any part of the blame of those circumstances upon me. I did everything for the best. I am not answerable for a deplorable calamity which it was quite impossible to foresee. 
I am shattered by it. I have suffered under it as nobody else has suffered. My servant, Louis, who is really attached to me in his unintelligent way, thinks I shall never get over it. He sees me dictating at this moment with my handkerchief to my eyes. I wish to mention, in justice to myself, that it was not my fault, that I am quite exhausted and heartbroken. Need I say more? End of track 21